You're listening to Coffee with Innovate Finance, where we speak with experts from the industry on the changing face of financial services and the future of fintech and financial innovation. I am Rashi Pandey, Head of Membership and Growth, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by Pinar Ozkan, who is the Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Oxford University's Saeed Business School. So we will be covering today open banking, open finance, looking at the UK in particular, key industry trends alongside financial wellness and literacy, which are so important, especially right now, and what the UK can learn from other geographies. So thank you so much for joining us today, Pinar. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for the invitation. So can you tell me a little more about your role and your background? What brought you to Oxford University Said Business School? Of course, um, I have always been um, in love with technology and strategy. I have a background. I have a PhD from Stanford University, and I spent 10 years in Silicon Valley studying and working with tech startups. And uh, since then, my research has always been about how technology impacts society and in particular, how it impacts co- competitive strategy, the way firms compete, and in particular, how startups can uh, change the world. And so within that, um, I have joined Oxford University four years ago um, and I as a professor of entrepreneurship and innovation. And since then, I've also taken on the role of the head of the entrepreneurship center, the academic director rather, as well as the founder and director of the Oxford Future of Finance and Technology Initiative, which is a research initiative. That is a lot of things that you, you know, present yourself in 24 hours, I was going to say that that's mighty, mighty impressive. And, you know, as the professor of entrepreneurship and innovation, of course, you know, you you said, you know, technology is a huge, huge passion. It has always been. I'm sure fintech must be a huge part of your role as well. So can you please share what is the mission and vision of Said Business School, especially when it comes to innovation and fintech? Of course, um, both in terms of the teaching that we do and in terms of the research that we do, fintech has been uh, playing a big role. In terms of the uh, teaching, uh, we have not only uh, fintech courses, uh, whether it's digital and open to public or for our MBA and executive MBA students, but also we allow our students and participants to uh, take part in the research through the Future of Finance and Technology Initiative. So currently there are um, uh, various people who are uh, looking into how open banking is progressing, for example, around the world, looking into the US, UK, Australia, India, Turkey. And um, at the same time, we have people whose passion is AI and looking into how AI is changing the financial industry. And so um, on the teaching and research side, there's quite a bit going on. And of course, we also have uh, PhD students and postdoctoral researchers who are looking into the effects of blockchain, who are looking into how financial wellness fintechs are doing and what kind of particular challenges they face if they if a fintech has a social mission in it more broadly. And uh, there's just so much research and we are finding out very interesting things, which I'm hoping to uh, present both uh, today as well as in future events. That's amazing to hear. And, uh, you know, to our listeners as well, we work very closely with you and your team, uh, you know, because we try and produce a lot of thought leadership and research pieces as well. And all of these really help drive the programs and the agenda forward, not only on the innovation side, but as well as, you know, on the policy and regulation side as well. Um, So do you work very closely with the industry as well on the practical side? And if so, how does the industry collaboration really look like? Of course, I think if you uh, do fintech research, there's, uh, in a sense, practically no way that you could be removed from industry. So uh, the fintech research that we do is exclusively with industry uh, in field work. uh, We we interview entrepreneurs. We look at the kinds of partnerships that they build. We look at the kinds of ecosystems they build around themselves. We talk to regulators to understand their particular pain points. So um, mostly with entrepreneurs and regulators, but also with large institutions who are looking to boost their innovative activity, either through partnerships or through in-house fintech activity. 
That's pretty cool, actually. And I like how you mentioned field work. Mm -hmm. um, so diving into some of the amazing work that you've done, like you mentioned a lot of the research as well. Your current research also includes the Open Banking Project, where you examine the industry's disruption in banking through regulation and the entry of fintechs and basically the development of the sharing economy. So can you tell us some of the key trends you see in open banking and some key takeaways from the reports? Of course, Oshi. Um, so today is actually a particularly good day for that because we are uh, we just sent back uh, the proofs of our uh, latest article back to the journal in order uh, to publish uh, our latest work on open banking. So we did this study on open banking. We've been looking into open banking and finance for several years now. And one of the things that we found out, which is going to be as part of this article, is that um, when the APIs that uh, the large banks were supposed to publish, when they did not work out the way that they were supposed to, there was a new industry role that came in, which was the API aggregator role. And that role is a very interesting one because they started as intermediaries, uh, mainly trying to solve a technical bottleneck. But then once these data connectors uh, were in the industry, they started to grow strategically and they started to invite other industries to connect to its financial data. So industries such as, uh, you know, uh, airlines and, and uh, supermarkets are now uh, working with financial data, mainly because they have been invited to connect and to uh, integrate uh, the financial data with their customer data in order to offer their customers more services and more products. And that has had a huge impact on embedded finance. And so what we see is that sometimes technical bottlenecks can give rise to new industry roles. And these new industry roles can give rise to new industry trends, such as embedded finance. And uh, that surely is causing a blurring of uh, industry boundaries. And overall, we're seeing that open uh, banking is having an effect not just on finance, but on other industries that may not have much to do with finance. I love how you said the blurring of industries, because that's very well said. And it's really what we are seeing as well. So, you know, which fintechs do you see and you think are doing really well within the open banking space? Well, uh, you know, on the one hand, we, of course, have to, again, repeat that uh, the, those who are connectors are doing really well. Um, I also think that uh, open banking has been uh, looking particularly good when it comes to particular tax, uh, particular tasks such as uh, taxes, for example, the way that HMRC has um, integrated uh, open banking into uh, the tax payment systems is, is great. But of course, when it comes to more specifically to fintechs, I would say that those that are looking to uh, facilitate embedded finance are doing particularly well. At Oxford, we have a tech accelerator called uh, the, the Creative Destruction Lab. And uh, in the last two years, embedded finance has been a huge theme there. All the investors that come through are looking to invest into embedded finance uh, startups, uh, mainly using open banking and open finance to make sure that customers can have more products and services where finance is a natural part of it rather than having to think about their finances separately. I think, like you said, embedded finance is a key topic. It has been, especially since last year, I would say. And consumers really want that seamless experience, don't they? So, you know, according to you, what is the future of open banking? And where do you see, you know, if there are any challenges? I'm sure there are. It's, it's financial services. And do you think we'll be able to successfully move to open finance in the next three years? I think so. I think that uh, open finance and open finance, in my opinion, is not even the final goal. Open finance is, again, another step. What we're looking uh, at, um, you know, in the broader space is uh, a world in which our data uh, from different parts of our lives is going to be shareable uh, with companies that can analyze that and give us better products and services. And so I think we're really going towards a future of open data more generally. But um, in the meantime, of course, the biggest obstacle is uh, the mindset of some of the current uh, industry players, which is that the data is theirs and that um, they should be looking into the data. The problem with that is that the larger a firm, and we know this you know, from uh, decades of uh, research, the larger a firm, the more difficult it is for them to be agile with data. 
data is in silos and IT is in legacy systems. And so um, these players have the data, but they don't necessarily have the agility to do what they should be doing with the data. Which brings forward really the the the, the topic of partnerships. I think that uh, startups who have the agility but don't have access to the data can really do a lot more if open banking and open finance work the way that it should. But we're still looking uh, to fight some of the cultural and some of the uh, more IT related challenges in large firms for that data to be truly accessible seamlessly. That's very well put, actually. And, you know, Pinar, you did mention some geographies, um, you know, and I'm not going to take names, otherwise I'll be giving the answer to the next question as well. But, you know, of course, as we know, the UK led open banking, but we are slowly being left behind by other geographies. We're seeing it as a massive opportunity. So how can the UK ensure we keep leading the way in open banking and open finance? That's a great question. And I have several researchers uh, looking into different countries and comparing and contrasting right now. But I can say that overall, um, on the one hand, uh, the fact that open banking was a regulatory led approach in the UK was a big bonus, because uh, if it's not regulatory led, then some of the um, uh, some of the difficulties that I mentioned before coming from large institutions become more of an obstacle. However, I think that uh, some countries are really uh, much more hands-on than UK might be right now. And I know, for example, that um, Australia has not even started with open banking, but went straight into open finance, which really made a difference because our uh, conversations with some of the fintechs showed that they don't necessarily just need payments data. They need access to other types of data. And if you're asking a customer to use open banking for part of their data and other older technologies like screen scraping for other types of data, then that creates confusion. And it also lowers the trust that the customer builds in the institution. And so I think that open finance itself, uh, jumping to that uh, was a good step. Of course, implementation is the uh, other side of the coin. Whether you can do that well or not is, is still remains to be seen. But I am really fond of some of the things that I'm seeing uh, on the regulatory side in, in Australia. Singapore is doing really well. And I'm also particularly fascinated with the way that open banking and open finance are going to make a difference for in people's lives in financial inclusion when it comes to uh, emerging countries. Um, we have some research going on in India, Turkey, Brazil, and we see that the impact of open banking there is even larger. And I'm particularly excited to see what happens there. Likewise, uh, you know, as well, I mean, the international markets are fascinating and it's really, really cool to see that the emerging uh, markets, like you said, they're they're catching up really fast and they're doing it really well. And financial inclusion is key. And I really think that we can learn a lot from them as well. So, you know, Pinar, you also mentioned that, you know, you do look after the Oxford Future of Finance and Technology Initiative. So, you know, of course, the Oxford Future of Finance and Technology Initiative researches the disruption caused by technology in the financial sector. So can you tell us more about this initiative? I know it's one of of your passions. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. It's one of my babies. I, I really uh, love spending time with the researchers there and organizing events. And so overall, what we do in this research initiative is we have determined a few topics which we find extremely uh, relevant right now. And one of them is date, the role of data and AI in finance. Another one, uh, which I think is perhaps one of the uh, biggest, is financial wellness. And finally, we have a more regulator-related uh, uh, stream of research, which is on open banking and open finance. And our researchers are working in the field and gathering data, and our methods are mostly qualitative, which means that it's, uh, so for example, for one project, we might go out and we might talk to 100 relevant individuals in the field in order to gather their views and synthesize them, and then to uh, provide papers where we um, where we showcase some of the best cases, and we also highlight the challenges. One of the things that I'm particularly proud there um, is female founders in a fintech series that we've started. So uh, highlighting the role of female founders and particularly in fintech, 
the cases, and I think right now we have a three and another two are on the way, look at some of the most successful fintechs in the field, some in the UK, some elsewhere in the world. And we look at how these fintechs are making a difference, particularly in financial wellness, either addressing the needs of a part of population like immigrants or refugees that may not have access to banking services, or looking into making pensions easier for um, everyone on the street who may not have an understanding of what their pensions might look like and might be scared to look into it. All these ways in which data, AI, and open banking can be used in order to make lives easier and give people the financial services that they need. So that's one of the things that I'm most passionate about there. I was going to say this is music to my ears. To be honest. So are there any other interesting stats in particular or trends or case studies that you can share with us that has come out of this initiative? Um, yes. So I've mentioned the open banking one, which is now coming out. Uh, there is one which is still kind of uh, in the oven coming out soon. And I can briefly mention that maybe, which is that um, we looked into the way that AI startups uh, grow. And we've seen some interesting trends there. And one of the things that we've realized is that because you cannot do AI without data, the startup's access to early data is extremely important. And typically startups that you know have no prior access or no prior relationships for, for data access will find some early customers whose data they, they can use for in a pilot study. However, this creates an interesting tension in that the algorithms that they develop become particularly married to this early data. And so when investors are later telling them, this is great, you've just shown me that you know there's interest in your product, you've gotten this early customer, now let's scale this up. Suddenly the algorithm stays particularly specific to, to that early type of client and the AI startups find it quite difficult to become more general firms. And so this is one of the, we call it the, the curse of the first customer, because normally that first customer is so important. But at the same time, if you're an AI firm, you have to be particularly careful about the kind of data you're getting, because you might be closing a lot of doors for the future. Wow, that's a very, very interesting point of view. I never really saw it that way, actually. And, you know, Pinar, coming back to financial literacy and wellness, we did mention this, um, you know, briefly when we were speaking earlier. But, you know, financial literacy and wellness is a key priority at Innovate Finance, as well as, of course, at Said Business School. So it has always been important, but it is more important than ever right now, especially with the current economic climate. So what are you guys doing at Said Business School to promote financial literacy and wellness? Several things. Uh, on the research side, we have um, um, some projects going on where we're trying to understand the particular challenges that entrepreneurs face. Well, you know, maybe I'll take a step back and say, um, I'm a strong believer that entrepreneurs who understand the local needs of the public, and particularly when it comes to financial literacy and uh, wellness needs, are the ones who are going to make a difference. So we're trying to reach out to these entrepreneurs and trying to understand the challenges that they face. And one of the challenges that is particular about financial wellness is that a lot of times the the, the products and services that uh, individuals, uh, citizens may need are not necessarily the ones that will make the fintech money. And so how does a for-profit fintech address financial wellness when part of what they need to do is educating and making sure that they uh, people use their credit cards well and they pay back and they understand such that they don't uh, necessarily fall into that trap of the fine print? And so we're trying to understand what are some of the uh, successful fintech models where the fintech can make money and at the same time they can serve customers and rather than uh, making money through the small print, actually by educating them and making them better off in their finances. I think that piece of research is critical <laughs> and will be extremely helpful to every entrepreneur out there within financial services. And what more do you think at this point um, fintechs can do, especially to address the different aspects of financial wellness around the world? Fintechs are already doing uh, a lot of things. I'm a strong believer. Again, of course, based on my background, you wouldn't be surprised, but AI and blockchain it will make a huge difference. So I'm seeing fintechs train chatbots 
for reaching people who may be um, not just financially, but actually illiterate. Uh, training chatbots in local dialects of, you know, uh, Turkey and India and all sorts of uh, rural parts of the world where um, people don't uh, not just have no access to bank branches or other financial uh, representatives, but they also don't have access uh, to uh, to um, schooling and education. And so I think that AI and chatbots are going to make a huge difference. And we're looking into a new projects at the Entrepreneurship Center where we might be doing some pilots with giving a bit of a simplified entrepreneurship education to, to some of these individuals who are out there and unable to reach education and seeing what difference it might make. Um, I think overall, blockchain can also be um, a great way, for example, in countries that are currently fighting corruption. Blockchain can be a great help. So, for example, one of the projects that my students are looking um, are at is uh, tracing how more and more charity organizations are using blockchain in order to trace the donations, not only giving uh, donors transparency about what's happening, but also in, uh, measuring impact in real time and uh, starting a feedback cycle where the more impact they can show, the more donations they can get. That's a brilliant initiative as well. And do you think, you know, you mentioned a lot, in the, especially in the emerging, you know, markets, how AI and, you know, blockchain can, you know, help, especially with big countries, different cultural barriers, languages, etc. Any countries the UK can learn from? That's a great question. So we're we're seeing a lot of interesting um, innovations coming from Africa. And um, particularly when uh, some of the infrastructure is missing, entrepreneurs become really innovative. So part of, you know, I mentioned the data scarcity project where we look at the way that entrepreneurs hack uh, some of the lack of data by, by uh, finding other types of data or collecting data in innovative ways that we might not be able to uh, imagine here. And um, I'm also seeing some interesting um, innovations coming out of um, Scandinavia. And particularly lately, Estonia has surprised me with some of the things they're doing. And Estonia is, of course, a small country that has really invested in, in their uh, IT infrastructure. And so um, perhaps it's not surprising, but it's really delightful to see. Um, overall, I think that um, in India, of course, um, on our website, there is a uh, the recording of an event that we did with uh, um, an amazing executive from IBM, Likit Wagli who has told us all about some of the ways that India has been innovating in order to give uh, people uh, better financial services, especially to those who are too poor to, to be noticeable by banks. And so um, I think that, uh, yeah, those will be some of the countries that I'm looking at, but um, continuing research definitely in Africa among all places. That's amazing. It's beautiful to see that uh, innovation brings everyone together and innovation really doesn't know any barriers, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, you know, on future gazing, what other fintech trends are you currently looking into and researching on? I think I can preempt this answer, but if you were to, you know, what are the top three key technologies and or innovations within financial services should we keep a lookout on? Sure. So I'll, I mean, I think that you could probably guess that I'm going to say AI and blockchain, but of course, these have different implications in different uh, in different settings. So uh, the implications of AI and blockchain for financial wellness and literacy, um, as well as uh, faster, better, cheaper services um, everywhere in the world. Um, uh, and of course, uh, with with regulations such as open banking and open finance, the way that uh, data analysis can help us uh, build um, embedded finance and help um, people around the world um, not worry about their finances because finance is already integrated into other products that they consume, whether that's education, whether that's health. Uh, whether that's much more simple everyday uh, products and services. So that's uh, those those will be definitely the, the uh, two out of three. But the third one, which I'm I'm still, I think, a little bit puzzled to see how it's going to play out because it's still early days, is um, looking into digital currencies and uh, decentralized finance. 
So um, we're starting a project on central bank digital uh, uh, currencies to see how an ecosystem might be building in different countries around the world and which, which countries we can learn from. And interestingly, we see smaller countries moving fast there, perhaps because a digital currency can, uh, can solve many problems that they might have. You know, transparency, uh, uh, corruption, um, and, uh, you know, some um, island states are really uh, investing into this because it can really make a difference in, in the way that uh, people trade. Um, but overall, I think decentralized finance is going to be interesting because it will change the players of the ecosystem. And some of those who uh, we might be relying on within financial systems um, may be pushed uh, rather to the periphery and other players might be taking their place. So I think it's going to be an interesting musical chairs activity there when decentralized finance becomes bigger. And I think, as I've said earlier, it, um, our tech accelerator um, investors are in addition to embedded finance, they're really paying attention to decentralized finance at the, uh, at the moment. I was going to say, Pinar, it has been such a pleasure speaking with you today. But before I let you go and closing on, what's your favorite thing about entrepreneurship and innovation that keeps you looking forward to what you do at Side Business School every single day? Oh, wow. Well, I, I think that one is, uh, I, I love uh, doing what I do, but Mostly, I think, finding these strategies that entrepreneurs use and then uh, diffusing them to the rest of society for everyone to use. And when I when I um, uh, stand in front of a crowd and if I tell them these are some of the things that people are doing and they seem to be working and if they can take those away and if their businesses are more successful, if they can improve financial wellness, financial literacy, then I've, and of course, if, if it inspires them, then uh, I feel amazingly fulfilled and I don't need anything else. That's amazing. And I do too truly believe that you and your team's work is extremely important and crucial, uh, you know, with what we are trying to do, not only at Innovate Finance, but within um, the sector and the financial services and fintech sector. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. It's been such a fun conversation. It really has. So thank you and more power to you and to the team. And honestly, to all our audience who are listening, I think uh, we can safely say we cannot wait for more research that actually comes out uh, from your team. So thank you once again for tuning into Coffee with Innovate Finance. Do look out for upcoming episodes and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn for more on our events and programs. And as always, until next time, please take very good care of yourselves.